Alright, so this is the system that I've been working on for quite some time and uh, here I have the control module that I built based on the schematic that I found online. Uh, I've modified it quite a bit, uh, for instance this case, the PCBs inside and a lot of other things I've designed from scratch. It is hooked up to this top heater, so basically this is the brains for the top heater. And uh, for the bottom heater, I'm using the preheating plate. So originally this machine was actually designed to control both top heater and bottom heater at the same time. So it was like a full-on BGA station. But I've decided to use this preheating plate T8280 because it made a lot more sense both financially and considering how much time it would take to build something like this. Okay, so I'm gonna go into details about how this works a bit later, uh, but right now I would like to show how it would normally happen when I use it. So what I would normally do is just turn on this preheater first, set the temperature to about 210 degrees Celsius, and uh, let it heat up. Um, there I have the thermocouple, processor is already desoldered but imagine that it's there this is just for the demonstration purposes so as this is heating up now I can already turn on this machine this is the button that turns on the logic so I'm gonna go over the functionality of this thing a bit later but right now the only thing I'm interested in is the temperature that is being measured at the top of the board uh, which is where this thermocouple is installed uh, next to that imaginary chip um, so when it reaches about 140 degrees then I will run the profile and it will turn on the top heater which will gradually heat the processor according to this pre-programmed temperature curve so I'm not gonna wait for it to be precisely 140 degrees uh, for the sake of the demonstration I'm gonna turn on the profile right now it gives you one long beep actually this is the button that turns on the top heater because uh, this is an extra safety feature just in case something goes wrong you can just shut off the heater with this switch and now you can hear that it's buzzing a little bit so it means it's working um, so it's, yeah, it's trying to follow that curve and slowly heat up the board or the processor. So you can see here's the temperature that is programmed inside this profile that I'm running, which is 230 degrees Celsius. And uh, this is the real temperature. So it's trying to follow these numbers. Okay, so I'm not gonna run the profile all the way because it's gonna give out a lot of toxic fumes and I still don't have the uh, fume extractor this is also just a prototype I was planning to attach the flexible ducting in the back so that it could take out all the smell out the window or something but uh, yeah this is how it would normally work Okay, so here is the interface and it's fairly simple. So it has a few basic functions here. But first of all, you can see the two temperature readings and at the moment I'm only using one sensor. But uh, I've designed the PCBs in a way that the second sensor could be added later. And this is useful if you would like to measure temperatures at both sides of the chip, for example. So the controls come with a few basic heating functions and here if you choose the custom mode it will allow you to adjust the heating from 0 to 100%. So this is only based on the power percentage. So the second option which reads auto in here allows you to uh, set the desired temperature that you wish the heater to reach based on the sensor readings and it will automatically maintain it. Uh, so these are sort of additional functions here. The most important mode is the temperature profile. So this firmware comes 
pre-programmed with 14 profiles, uh, so it covers both LED and LED-free applications. So once the profile is activated, the other custom settings are overridden. So I 3D printed this case using PETG plastic, but let's take a look inside and I try to keep it as neat as I could. All the parts and PCBs, I, I tried to organize the wires as much as I could. I had to make some modifications to the PCBs because um, turns out I made a few mistakes when I was designing them, but in any case it still ended up looking pretty nice so this the cover itself has a lot of parts attached to it so yeah all right so here i also have the top heater assembly and it's mounted onto this uh, adjustable screen arm. You can adjust the assembly on all axes. Uh, you can move it like this, like that, sideways. You know, you can adjust the height here with this screw. I am using the custom-made quartz pipe heater. It was a bit pricier and difficult to get comparing to the regular ceramic heater, but I believe it's better because here you have all these pipes installed in rows and I believe this will provide more even heat. But this is still not something all that simple if you think that, you know, this looks simple enough. This actually took me quite a long time to build and it took a lot of testing and fitting. And so this flexible thermocouple snake thing, I also had to screw into the case because otherwise the magnets that it came with, they were pretty much useless, they didn't hold and this is the only way to keep it attached to something so that it doesn't move. Uh, I also wanted to mention the uh, temperature sensor wire. So in this picture you can see uh, K-type thermocouples. So it seems like the non-twisted wire is the best of them all. Because the twisted wire apparently tends to give erroneous temperatures. So it all started when I got interested in the idea of uh, fixing broken motherboards. And a lot of times it required reballing or replacing the chip that was soldered to the board. So I started searching the internet for a machine that could be built on a budget. And uh, I came across this website. It was written in Russian. So what they have here is the DIY BGA soldering station and it's got the schematic, it's got images of how the machine can look like. Unfortunately, it's not very precise uh, instruction. So it's all based on the assumption that you have considerable knowledge of working with AC electricity, that you could select appropriate cables, install the furrows and other things that are related to electrical installations. It also assumes that you've got necessary skills and tools to build a metal case which will house all these lamps and other equipment. There was no mechanical drawings shared and it's not easy to build it yourself using home tools. The schematic itself is also not targeted for inexperienced users. So once again, it is extremely dangerous to attempt to assemble this if you're not familiar with electrical principles. However, I was doing electrical studies and I thought this was a great opportunity for practice. In any case, at first I followed the schematic and all these examples blindly and it ended up looking like this. Oh man. So it also took a ridiculous amount of time to mount 
everything together out of spare metal parts, uh, just using anything I could find. And while it worked, it was certainly not very safe to use. Electrically, it was quite dangerous. I wasn't very experienced yet, so I just threw it all together hastily and I didn't pay much attention to making it reliable or safe. The case itself was also very unstable and I knew it would have to be redone someday. And also later it became quite clear that the lamps simply don't cover enough area for larger motherboards. The PCBs and all the electrical parts were also put inside an old PS3 case, but they were just very clumsily thrown together. Alright, so I've decided to break this circuit down into sections and here I've outlined everything that I'm going to use in green and everything in red I'm not going to need at all. For instance, these bottom heater lamps and the circuit related to it I'm not going to use because like I've showed you before, I've decided to go with the preheating plate Puhuiti 8280 and uh, here's the vacuum pickup tool, so it's also something in case you want to build your own and I'm not going to do that, it's just again something that takes extra time. I'm also going to change the power supply because right here it's something very strange. It's using 19 volts power brick pro from a laptop at first and then they build DC to DC converter to get 5.12 volts out of it. So I'm gonna do it easier, I'm gonna build another power supply that's just smaller. Okay, so after we got rid of the extra parts, now we have this and it's already looking a lot easier. I only kept the components that are needed for the upper heater to operate. So here we have the microcontroller, the encoder button, um, the display, uh, thermocouple amplifiers, uh, upper heater voltage regulation circuit, and um, the power supply for the logic which I'm going to build. And I also wanted to clarify a few of these uh, arrows because they were all over the place. Now they're actually pointing in the right direction. So all these uh, DC 5.12 volt arrows, they are inputs and uh, it's all coming from this power supply. And so one thing I didn't fully research is why it needs to be 5.12 volts precisely, but apparently it's something required by this microcontroller. But unfortunately this circuit still has one fatal flaw here. So if this section loses this 5 point volts input, then it's going to give maximum power to the heater and uh, it's just gonna be a disaster. And actually I had this happen to me in my first tests a long time ago. I fried the chip and I didn't even realize it at first. I thought it was just going a bit hot, but it was in fact at full power because it just lost this 5 volts. So in the next image you can see I've decided to add a relay that can cut off power to this circuit in case of a problem with 5 volts line. Unfortunately, I got a little confused about the relays. So even though originally I was planning to put the regular version, when I began to understand it better in terms of how the heater's power is controlled, and with the help of a few friends, I began to realize that this circuit here is in fact a raw version of the SSR relay. Essentially, it's performing the same exact function as a solid state relay would. So it hit me that I could just throw this entire circuit out and install this uh, solid state relay instead. And this is how it should be done and I'm going to test it out later, but for the moment I'm going to use the circuit that I already built. I was simply following the previous schematic and since it works I'm gonna let it be for now.
So my original thought was to create these assemblies as add-ons to the bottom heater and uh, possibly sell them in case there was any interest. Of course, it was still implied that you own some type of a bottom heater device. But then again, I've tried to calculate the costs and it's rather challenging to make any sort of profit on it comparing to the effort that's involved. I would also obviously want to use the quality parts and that would drive the price of the construction higher than I would have liked. And at that point it might be more affordable to just order a finished BGA station directly from China. So this idea is still undecided. There is however one other option that I would like to test out and turns out there is already a much smaller controller that could be built with the upper heater. And it's called a tiny reflow controller and I was going to order it to see how well it performs. However, However, I ran into an obstacle of a ridiculous shipping cost and contacting the seller hasn't helped because he claimed to have a deal with the shipping company and refused to ship it any other way. But since the device's schematic was open source, I've decided to order the PCBs and the components and just solder the thing myself. It still wasn't that simple because his bill of materials involved components that weren't sold anymore, but I think I got most of them. So let me know if you're interested interested in seeing me build the tiny reflow controller. I've also added a PayPal ME button in case you want to support videos like this. The reason I don't make it more often is because it is financially costly and I don't always feel motivated because I don't know if there's enough interest. So if you subscribe or buy me a coffee, I might feel more compelled to make more projects like this. Either way, thank you for watching and hopefully see you next time.